Good morning, church. Uh, this is a part of service where we reflect on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we are remembered for the sacrifice that he did for us on the cross. Uh, my name is uh, Wilfredo. For all those who don't know me, I am a campus student. Um, and I will be introducing our dear sister, Nancy. Um, you know, I just want to share briefly about her. If there's, if there's anything that you should know about um, Nancy is that, you know, when I first came from London and uh, I came back to New York, you know, I didn't really plan that far ahead. I was like, I don't know where I'm going to stay. Um, yeah. And essentially, uh, the Vishikinis took me in, right? Uh, so Aaron and Charmaine right now, they're not here. But uh, Nancy, you know, she lives with them. And she was generous enough to allow me to live in, in her room uh, while she, you know, stayed. Uh, so she commutes from Pennsylvania. She'll share about that. Um, but she allowed me to stay for a few months and she still paid rent. And that just shows, you know, that, that gives you a glimpse of her sacrifice um, as a disciple. Uh, but she's asked me to read this uh, scripture in James chapter 1. I'll be reading from verse 13, and it's in the Good News translation. So the Bible reads, If we are tempted by such trials, we must not say, This temptation comes from God, from God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But we are tempted when we are drawn away and trapped by our own evil desires. Then our evil desires conceive and give birth to sin, and when sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. I give you Nancy. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you, Will. Okay, breathe. I'm using my phone. This is not technically the normal thing for me. I use pieces of paper, so yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for allowing me to share for communion and what the cross means to me. My name is Nancy Vichikini, and I am encouraged to be part of the Sophisticated Soul Sip Sisters. Amazing, mature women's Bible talk. And we meet every Monday night at 7.30 on Zoom if you're interested in joining us. Um, amen. So where do I begin? Um, can I tell you that I have celebrated my 68th birthday and only 10 of those years, only 10 of those years did I live for Christ. So needless to say, my sin became full grown in that scripture during those 50 plus years when I was without God. Um, I grew up in a small town outside of Philadelphia. Uh, my dad built the house that we lived in, you know, like shovels and everything, my dad. Um, but we're talking in the 1950s, because that's how old I am. And um, one room at a time, but dad would add to the house because this family was growing. So it was pretty cool. And then I can say that my childhood was fun and venturesome. I spent our summers at Cape May, New Jersey. And that was long enough before they made you pay to get on the beach. It's like, what happened to my beach? It was free. Life was easy. Um, I have one sister a little bit older than me. And as the baby in the family, when I pushed boundaries in obedience or, um, you know, just, yeah, not listening, I could easily blame my sister, though, because she was the oldest one. And I did that readily, so I didn't get in trouble, uh, which taught me to um, look innocent and lie and steal and pretend and it wasn't really me, you know, it was my sister did these things. So I'll show you a couple examples. Um, in ninth grade, our parents went out of town and left my sister and I to take care of the house. And no sooner did they pull out of the driveway and we were on the phone calling all our friends and the house is empty, time for a party, bring what you got. And, um, you know, from my parents' standpoint, they of course thought we were trustworthy. And all the booze that they had in the house got emptied out, and we just filled those bottles with water. I don't know if you ever did that, but that's what we did when we were kids. We filled them with water so they wouldn't know we were drinking. It was so stupid. Now it sounds so dumb. 
Anyway, um, that party lasted for several days and didn't end well. My sister got caught in the middle of a rowdiness between a couple guys and was accidentally pushed through our storm door, which was glass, and she cut her neck. Um, she could have been killed that night. <sighs> but she was the one who took all the heat when my folks came home because they couldn't stitch her up without uh, an adult family member to do it. So they had to give permission for the stitches, you know, in the hospital. So my uncle had to go and do that. So there was no hiding this one. You know, the parents would have to know. But again, um, my sister took most of the heat because she was the oldest one. She was supposed to be taking care of us. Um, the thing was, most of the kids in the house were probably my friends and not even hers. Whew. At the age of 14, I had a juvie record for underage drinking. I mean, good Lord. It's so disgusting to me now. My parents were called to bail me out. And you could hear my mom scream through the police station. She was so devastated. I was still her innocent little kid. Uh, and I tell you these things because it didn't really stop there. It wasn't like I got scared of it. I, I, my drinking became, uh, you know, adding marijuana and pills or powders. I, I just didn't seem to have any particular direction. Um, except that the one that led to more sinful desires and more sinful situations. Ooh. Being rebellious, though, was my fun thing. Um, the more I indulged, the easier it was for me to just kind of mask growing up, you know? It's just a screen. And uh, I didn't know how to have a good time without using something. I would even get angry at the sober people around me who loved me. Um, if they were disrupting my high, I could easily leave them sitting there without even saying goodbye. Um, and it wasn't that my addiction was so, uh, like I had to have a drink every day or I had to have a cigarette or I had to smoke a joint. And know that. It was more, and it wasn't like I had to hide the vodka under the kitchen sink, you know, because that's, that's seriously addiction. But my addiction was more to... Um, retreat uh, from my life, maybe, to retreat from responsibility um, and accountability. Uh, I always pushed that off on somebody, and I didn't want to be responsible in that way. And I made decisions during those drunken evenings that could have gotten me killed. Uh, when I got pregnant, I uh, freaked out and uh, scheduled an abortion. Nothing was going to get me out of my own self you know, I, I wasn't ready for such a thing. And it, and it lasted for decades. I mean, 50 years that I was in the world. Whew. I got married to the man of my dreams. John and I met in uh, Pennsylvania in high school. And then we got married in Colorado. And then we moved to Florida. And then we moved to Arizona. So we moved around a lot. Um, my two boys, I have two amazing sons. We have two amazing sons. Um, most of you know our youngest one is Aaron. Mm -hmm. I do hope that one day you'll get to meet my oldest son and my husband, um, that they'll be sitting out here too. I can't wait for that day. Um, but even getting married and having children didn't mature me. I was still hiding. Uh, from myself and saying and doing things that had no depth to my character. I couldn't go to social events without holding on to a drink. Uh, it was my security. And I would go refill it when conversations became tedious or complicated. I'd, oh, I have to go get a drink, you know. Um, and parents, I am one now, are supposed to be setting an example for their children. And I was no example. And Aaron was headed down the same road I traveled. I could see my lost self in his red eyes. And it wasn't, it was ugly, to be honest. And he's a cute kid, and it just looked so ugly. And I was so sorry that that's where he was going. He got met by a disciple of Christ and began to study the Bible. Thank you, Father. And the time and effort that he was putting into studying a Bible was just unheard of in my household. I mean, I'd never seen anything like it. Um, and God transformed Aaron right in front of us. He used our youngest son to show me 
that all was not lost. Wow. A couple years later, I'm watching Aaron preach his very first sermon. He's in San Francisco. And I'm looking at this thinking, who is this guy? Who is this young man? Um, it was incredible. So I was witness to a completely different child, who is my son, and standing there preaching the word so powerfully. And to the glory of God, something awakened in me that day. I wanted to learn how to let go of my sinful desires. I began to study the Bible with women. You know, it takes a lot to study the Bible with somebody because I was not uh, soft-hearted and I was not ready sometimes. And they lovingly, sacrificially just nurtured my heart. And after all those years, my heart began to change and to really learn to love. After several months, <laughs> I gradually laid down my party hat and slowly came into a relationship with God. I started coming to church, not just any church, but where I was being taught through women who knew God. It was this church. I found that God had desires for me. He had plans for me and a purpose. The Bible talks about laying down one's life for one another, selflessly, and that we are created in his likeness. But the scripture that challenged me to finally surrender my life was in Matthew 24 and verse 42 and 3. It says, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. So this is Jesus' return, right? And I heard it in my head, like from a distance, it was like surreal. Are you still going to be studying the Bible when Jesus comes? Or are you going to be ready? And it was that very morning, and only one girl was still coming to my house, because they probably were writing me off one by one. But Sandy Lundy, God bless her, she came over and um, I asked her, can you baptize me, like today, like now? And she just, of course I can. She said, do you want to go over to my house where there's Bible, Bible they're singing, you know, there were the, um, the choir is practicing. She says, they're at my house right now. Come on, we'll go over there. And I'm like, nope, I don't want to go anywhere. I said, if you can do it, I'll give you clothes. We're going to write my backyard. We, she baptized me that day. Come on. Hmm. But here's what I said. So not knowing what God has in store for you when you decide to surrender, right? So if this were a wall in my house, while she goes to change her clothes, I walk up to the wall and it's my head against the wall and I go, I don't know what you have in store for me, Lord, but I'm gonna do my best to show up for you. Come on. It's like stepping over the edge of a cliff, really. It's, you have no idea what you're falling into and I have never once looked back. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that Jesus came to save the lost, like me, that he died on the cross for me, and he said, forgive them, for they know not what they do, which was me. Jesus forgave me that day. I have since learned that we stop growing up emotionally when we use drugs and alcohol, and I was an early teen, so I'm finally growing up. It sounds so dumb, I'm so old, but amen. I am rewriting my story now. I have been sober, completely sober, for seven years, and I am coming out of hiding. If you're visiting today, this is a scripture in 1 Corinthians 15, 34. It says, wake up from your drunken stupor. <laughs> As is, is right, and do not go on sinning. So if that's you, God speaks to you in this way. But ask whoever invited you today to study the scriptures and allow the scriptures to rewrite your story so that you'll be ready when Jesus returns. Thank you for listening. Amen, family, let us pray.
Uh, dear God, uh, Lord, we all, God, before you showed yourself to us, God, you, we, we had our past, Father. We, uh, we were either, God, drunkards, God, or we were in drugs, or we were living an immoral life, God, sexually immoral, whatever, God, the case may be. Uh, we all have, Father, something to remember, God, and to be grateful for, uh, that you have forgiven us, Lord, and that you, God, have taken up our sins that put you on the cross and that shed your blood, that now, God, your blood is, is what saves us, Father. God, we show our lives, God, as disciples uh, in gratitude, Father, thanksgiving to bring glory and honor to you, Father God, who have called us out of the darkness into your wonderful light. God, I pray that we do not forget, Lord, your sacrifice every single day. Uh, please be with us, God, just as you promised. And we love you, Lord. Pray all of these things, God, in your son's mighty name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.